In the summer of 1952, 10-year-old Constance Christine Connie Smith from Sundance, Wyoming, was eager to go away to Camp Sloan in Salisbury, Connecticut. She was going away on her own for the first time, and in the days leading up to the camp, she was unable to stop talking about it. At the camp, too, she appeared to be having a fun time, so it was rather strange that on July 16, 1952, she abruptly left the camp on her own and vanished without a trace. What had happened to Connie Smith? How could no one have known where she went? Hi, and welcome to Real Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and mysterious cases from across the globe. Today, we are looking at the story of the disturbing disappearance of Connie Smith. If you haven't already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel to get the latest crime stories delivered directly to your inbox. Without further ado, let's dive deep into the story. This case begins in Wyoming. On July 11, 1942, Constance Christine Connie Smith was born. She was the youngest daughter of Peter Franklin Smith and Helen Jensen. The couple also had another child, Nels Jensen Smith, who was three years older than Connie. Peter Franklin Smith, Connie's father, was the son of Wyoming's former governor. Helen Jensen, her mother, was also from a well-brought family, so Connie and her brother Nels were not neglected. However, Connie's parents weren't happy with each other. As time passed, things between them turned sour, and they finally divorced in 1949. Connie was just seven years old at the time. But even during the divorce, Connie, her mother, and brother continued to stay at Ranch A in Sundance, which belonged to her father. Her father, Peter Franklin Smith, later remarried and went on to have two more daughters. But despite Peter's remarriage, it did not affect his relationship with Connie, as he would often visit her from time to time. In the summer of 1952, Helen decided to meet her family in Greenwich, and she took Connie along with her. On reaching Greenwich, Helen met her parents, Carl and Esther Jensen, and her sister, Ruth Jensen McWilliams. During a family get-together, Helen, Connie's mother, decided that it would be better for her daughter to go to a summer camp to avoid boredom and have some fun. So she signed Connie up for a camp program at Camp Sloan, which was then managed by the YMCA of Westchester County, New York. In those days, Camp Sloan was a well-known place. Although it was founded in 1928, it has kept its name over time. Now, the camp is located in the Connecticut town of Lakeville. To get there, you needed to go inside a forest. However, the place had a number of camping-friendly natural routes. It was also close to some hills, which were visible from the campsite. The camp's creators placed a strong focus on the values of its campers from the beginning, saying they only recruited the best and most qualified personnel. This was what initially drew Helen's attention to the camp when she heard about the program. Connie left for the camp in July, although the precise date is unknown. Despite this, we do know that she was quite eager to attend the camp, she was a kind girl who got along with both children and adults. She also cherished animals, particularly horses. When she arrived at the camp, she appeared to be really enthusiastic. The reason being that she was thrilled with the various activities that were scheduled for the camp, as they included a horse show and square dance. On July 13th, Connie was visited by her mother and her maternal grandparents. When she met them, she told them about the camp's planned activities that were supposed to take place in the last week of July. Connie loved horses, and since there was a horse show planned in the camp's events, she asked her mother for permission to stay at the camp until the end of the month. However, her mother did not agree to Connie's request. She insisted that Connie was going to return to Wyoming by the end of July. This disheartened Connie. But instead of reacting, she bit her tongue and agreed to her mother's decision. On July 16, 1952, early in the morning, Connie got into a brawl with a number of other female campers. Although the exact reason for the argument is unknown, it is known that Connie had been bullied for her appearance since she was more mature than a typical 10-year-old. The fight caused her to get a bloody nose. Back in her tent after the fight, she reached for an ice pack that she had gotten from the camp infirmary the night before. 
Apparently, the previous night, Connie had injured her hip when tumbling out of her tent. Connie saw that the ice pack had melted, so she decided to go to the infirmary to get more ice. She informed her tentmates that she would be skipping breakfast because she needed to return the ice pack and then get ready for the day's activities. She then changed into a vivid red jacket and blue shorts before making her way to the camp's infirmary. Little did she know that she would never return. Connie had now been gone for several hours. It was only during the afternoon hours that Carol Baker, Connie's group leader, noticed Connie wasn't around. Concerned by this, she went to report it to the camp director, Ernest P. Roberts. This was then brought to the attention of the camp counselors. They immediately went to check her tent. However, when they got there, they found the dispensary ice pack still inside. Connie was nowhere to be seen. However, her clothes and other belongings were still inside the tent. Worried about what might have happened to her, they conducted an extensive search throughout the campsite. However, it did not turn up any clues as to her whereabouts. Without any hope, the camp director then approached the police to handle the matter. When the police took up the case, they were determined to find Connie. They immediately began laying down tracks for where Connie could have been seen before she vanished, despite having very little knowledge of her behavior. A camp counselor recalled seeing Connie walking towards the Indian Mountain Road. However, what was surprising was that the counselor never detained Connie or even asked her a question. As the case progressed, the news about Connie's disappearance brought forward many witnesses. Some of them came forward and reported seeing her picking daisies nearby. Another private homeowner who stayed on Indian Mountain Road claimed that a young girl who resembled Connie's description knocked on her door and asked how to get to Lakeville, Connecticut. She also added that the girl had tears in her eyes. And later that day, a husband and wife, whose identities were not disclosed, saw her attempting to hitchhike near the intersection of U.S. Route 44 and Belgo Road. After that, the trail to where Connie could have gone went cold. There was no further information after they got to Route 44 near Belgo Road. It was then that the police decided that the disappearance of Connie Smith wasn't just a lost child case. It was something more. On an immediate alert, the barracks across the country were alerted to the matter. In a matter of time, several detectives rushed in, bloodhounds were put on the trail, and airplanes from the Connecticut wing of the Civil Air Patrol and Air Force planes from Westover Field, Massachusetts, were flying overhead. Even jeeps were used to search through the woody terrain. However, despite such massive search efforts, Connie was nowhere to be found. When in Wyoming, Connie would often camp alone. She was also taught to walk off trail and lay signs to find her way back. However, it seemed as though she never found her way back to the camp when she left it. The police notified Connie's parents, Helen and Peter, of their daughter's disappearance. Shocked to hear the news, Helen drove as fast as she could from Greenwich. Her father took a flight from Wyoming to Lakeville. On reaching the place, they were first sent in for questioning. The police wanted to rule out every possibility, since the couple was divorced, so it was highly likely that one of them wanted to take custody of the child. During the questioning, they asked if either parent had kidnapped her to take her from the other. The response stated that such a thought had never even occurred to either parent. On hearing their statements, the police then concluded that Connie's disappearance was a kidnapping. However, in the days that followed, no ransom arrived. On top of that, no one in Lakeville saw Connie. She never took a bus or a taxi or visited any of the stores. In the months that followed, the police never failed to search for Connie. More than 11,000 circulars were printed and tacked up in service stations, post offices, restaurants, schools, and fish and game departments around the country. According to an article by the Register Citizen, truck drivers, traveling carnival workers, and gypsies from Arkansas who camped along Route 22 were questioned about Connie's disappearance. Every time a lead was found, her father would also participate in investigating it. Apparently, investigators also took to hiding in the forest for several days to see if Connie was being held against her will. However, nothing came of it. Where could have Connie gone? 
As the days turned into weeks and then months, the probability of solving this case seemed to decrease with every passing second. In 1951, a year before Connie vanished, William Henry Redmond, a former Carnival employee, strangled Jane Marie Althoff, an eight-year-old Pennsylvania girl. Redmond was said to have been in the Lakeville area on the day Connie vanished. Leo Turcott, a former state trooper from Connecticut, clarified this information. Three years after Connie vanished, in 1955, Leo recalled receiving an anonymous phone tip from a man in Montreal who claimed to have worked for a carnival in the Lakeville area and to have knowledge of the girl's disappearance. However, it was discovered to be a hoax when the police looked into the situation. Redmond was taken into custody for the 1951 slaying of the girl. He was given the maximum sentence. Then 66 years old, Redmond admitted to a fellow prisoner that he had killed four people in his lifetime while serving this sentence in 1988. He did, however, pass a polygraph examination in the case of Connie's disappearance. Redmond later passed away in prison in 1992. In April 1953, according to the police's case report, which was confirmed by Detective Downs, who was assigned the Connie Smith case, he received a tip and a confession from a traveling jewelry salesman, Frederick Pope. He told them that he knew where Connie Smith was. Pope alleged that he and an associate, Jack Walker, picked Connie up on Route 44, promising her a ride back to Wyoming. Pope claimed that Walker killed Connie in Arizona and that Pope himself later beat Walker to death with a tire iron. This all seemed like gold dust to the detectives in the Connie Smith case. Upon deeper examination, however, the story fell apart as no records of Jack Walker existed. Pope later admitted the story was a hoax and was dismissed as a suspect. In later years, there were more leads and suspects in connection with Connie's disappearance. One of these was a man named George Davies, who in 1957 was doing time and awaiting execution for the brutal murder of two girls named Gatane Boyvin and Brenda Doucette in Connecticut. While languishing in prison, he came forward to admit that he had also killed Connie Smith and had buried her body on the bank of the Naugatuck River. However, police could not find the body. Later, they realized that Davies was actually giving false information. When the police confronted Davies, he revealed that he had made up the whole story about Connie Smith. Another suspect that was looked into was August Epp. He was the camp's caretaker and gatekeeper at the time, but also had a criminal record. On the day that Connie disappeared, he claimed to have seen Connie picking daisies as she walked. When asked by police officers as to why he didn't stop her, he answered by saying that he thought that Connie wasn't a camper. Since she was physically more mature than a typical 10-year-old girl, Connie's appearance from afar misled him. But owing to his criminal history, August was interrogated regarding the matter. However, since the police saw no evidence that could link August to Connie's disappearance, he was eventually ruled out as a suspect. The disappearance of Connie Smith was always on the family's mind, and Peter Smith, Connie's father, even consulted psychics at one point. One source states that Peter went to a woman named Lady Wonder, who was known for her psychic abilities. Around that time, she had allegedly used her psychic abilities to solve the case of a missing four-year-old boy named Danny Matson in Quincy, Massachusetts, which led to her fame. On hearing what Lady Wonder could do, Peter Franklin Smith, Connie's father, sought out her services. However, when Lady Wonder tried to use her psychic abilities, she saw no sign of Connie in her visions. Astonishingly, Lady Wonder later ended up admitting that she had made up all the information regarding the missing boy's case, which had led to her fame. It turns out it was just a fluke that she had been able to solve the case. However, with regard to Connie Smith's disappearance, she revealed that she knew nothing about it. This left Peter feeling disheartened and led the case to another dead end. As the years followed, the investigation into the case of the disappearance of Connie Smith did have some leads. One such lead was in 1958 when the police managed to dig up the skeletal remains of a girl at a place called Skinner Ridge in the Grand Canyon National Park. 
The body found was decaying, unclothed, and lying prone. Investigators stated that the body could have been there for possibly over a year. There were also other things found beside the body, like clothing, a comb, and a nail file case. Could these be the remains of Connie? The investigators could not determine that since the face and other physical markers that could identify the girl were all decayed. Hence, the body of the girl was labeled as Little Miss X. When Connie's family found out about the news of Little Miss X, this caught their attention and it set off a full-fledged investigation. However, after four years in 1962, it was found that the skeletal remains did not actually belong to Connie Smith. The evidence examined by a Colorado dental surgeon, Dr. David Berman, and a pathologist, Dr. George I. Ogura, made it clear that the bones did not belong to her, the Associated Press reports. Though dental findings stated that the three fillings of the same technique and material used by the family's dentist at the time were found, the possibility that it could be Connie was ruled out. The hunt for Connie also led her mother Helen to post two rewards. One reward was staked for her return, and the other for her whereabouts. However, despite offering a handsome reward, no one came forward with any information. These dead ends to the case brought despair to both Connie's family and the police investigators. However, despite failed efforts, the police did have a few suspects in relation to the disappearance of Connie Smith. A few years later, in 2002, an article brought forth a new lead that the police were to investigate. Carol Andrews, who was once known as Carol Baker, came forward in relation to the case. She was also the former leader of the group that Connie was in. When the police approached her and asked for a statement on the matter, she revealed that she had met two intimidating men during her stay at the camp. While sharing her story, she recalled that at the camp, while she and her sister were playing together, two men had come up and tried to talk to them. However, on seeing them, Carol and her sister went into hiding since they both looked sinister and frightening. As the two men left, they then got in a car that had a license plate reading QF5876. This was a New York plate. The two men who had appeared were apparently thugs who had stolen this vehicle. However, when police tried to look further into who they were, nothing could be found. Connie's family was very traumatized by the experience. Her brother, Nell Smith, never really recovered from the disappearance of his sister. At the age of 13, he had to deal with a great deal of trauma. His sister's disappearance made him question a lot of things. On the other hand, Connie's father never gave up on finding his daughter. Even though he remarried, he never stopped looking for Connie. But with no leads, the probability of Connie's case never getting solved seems high. Sadly, on February 22, 2012, Peter Franklin Smith, Connie's father, passed away, never getting to know what happened to his daughter. Helen Jensen, Connie's mother, on the other hand, never remarried. She, too, never gave up on finding her daughter. However, at the age of 47, she suffered a cardiac arrest. Sources stated that she was very disheartened and depressed after her daughter's disappearance. Nell Smith, Connie's brother, took up the case to find out what might have happened to his sister after their father passed away in 2012. Nell's was articulate and sharp-minded, and he took up his father's mantle with great determination and grit. In 1954, when he had heard about the discovery of the little girl's skeletal remains, he had a more optimistic view. Though the remains were found in the Grand Canyon, which was 2,700 miles away from Lakeville, Nels did want to store the evidence and have that DNA collected. However, his mother dismissed the idea of going further with the investigation of the remains. Other sources that have suggested the case of Connie Smith's disappearance suggest that Connie was likely the victim of foul play. At the time, crimes like that were often seen a lot, especially in the age demographic of 10 to 13-year-old girls. Though the case is very sad and disturbing, if a similar case were to occur in today's age, it would eventually get solved. However, Connie's disappearance happened during a time when technology couldn't offer much help. 
Michael Dooling, author of Clueless in New England, The Unsolved Disappearances of Paula Weldon, Connie Smith, and Catherine Hull, published in 2010, said, Connie's disappearance, and the others I wrote about, strikes fear in our hearts. Dooling, who is also an antiquarian and a news librarian for the Waterbury Republican American newspaper, added, How can such a nice, normal ten-year-old girl be seen by so many people on her way to the center of Lakeville and then disappear so completely? Though we don't know what really happened to Connie Smith, here are a few conclusions that investigators made. The first was that Connie may have been the victim of a hit-and-run case, and secondly, she could have actually gotten in a car when she was asking for a lift on Route 44. Investigators believed that she had been homesick after her mother visited her on July 13, 1952. However, the case is just so disturbing. How could she disappear with so many other people around, simply vanishing off the face of the earth? Did she run away? Was it foul play or something entirely different? It is frustrating to know that, decades later, there are still many questions that remain unanswered and that her ultimate fate is still unknown. We only have the knowledge that she left the camp and was never seen again, leaving us to only wonder and speculate. I hope you have enjoyed watching this video. What do you think happened to Connie? If you have more opinions about this case, then do let us know your thoughts about it in the comments section below. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.